please stand for our scripture reading this morning. O oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Please grant me success today by making the king favorable to me. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. In those days, I was the king's cupbearer. Early the following spring in the month of Nisan, during the 20th year of King Azertzi's reign, I was serving the king his wine. I had never before appeared sad in his presence, so the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Then I was terrified, but I replied, Long live the king. How can I not be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried is in his ruins, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. The king asked, Well, how can I help you? With a prayer to the God of heaven, I replied, If it please the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, Send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. The king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked, How long will you be gone? When will you return? After I told him how long I would be gone, the king agreed to my request. I also said to the king, If it please the king, let me have letters addressed to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River, instructing them to let me travel safely through their territories on my way to Judah. And please give me a letter addressed to Asaf, the manager of the king's forest, instructing him to give me timber. I will need it to make beams for the gates of the temple fortress, for the city walls, and for a house for myself. And the king granted these requests because the gracious hand of God was on me. You may be seated. Thank you, Bird. How's everybody doing today? Good? Y'all thought the choir was playing. They ain't playing. They ain't playing. Thank you guys, everybody in the worship team and everybody. It was awesome. Glad everybody's here today. If I haven't had a chance to introduce myself or maybe you slid in here a little bit late, my name's Jason and I'm the pastor here. And uh, we're continuing a series that we started last week called How to Begin Again, Again. How to Begin Again, Again. And really what we're just talking about is rebuilding things, starting fresh, trying again. Because I don't know about you, but I've found in my life that while there are criticisms, uh, you know, directed towards me or why there are cynical or pessimistic people in my life, my biggest critic is myself. My biggest critic is myself. I'm most cynical about myself. And it's hard to try again after you failed. It's hard to bring it up again after it hasn't gone well. It's hard to start fresh after every fresh start has ended poorly. And so as you try to start again, or you muster the motivation to to get it going again. You're battling all of these thoughts in your mind and all of these feelings in your heart of like, what's the point? Is it even going to matter? Is it going to work? You know, we think about situations like our marriage. I know there's, you know, a lot of you in the room right now who are wanting a fresh start in your marriage or in your family. And you're, you're, you say, well, we've tried before. You know, we've had come to Jesus meetings before. We've tried counseling before. We've done the big vacation before. We've tried the fresh starts, but it seems to always go poorly. And so you're not sure if you can begin again, again. Or maybe it's your personal health, your physical health. You say, yeah, I'm just always trying and failing, trying and failing, starting and failing, or your financial situation. Ultimately, for all of us, there's probably a spiritual condition that we think about where it's like, I want to be a more spiritual person. I want to have more of a relationship with Jesus. I want to feel closer to Jesus. I want to feel farther from sin. I, I want to be a better person in some way or another. But, you know, just so many, so many failures, so many falls, so many mess ups. And that's really what we're, we're wanting to talk about is just trying again, rebuilding the things in our life that matter. Because the Bible tells us, Proverbs tells us that the godly may trip seven times, but they get up again. That there's something to this Christian life about perseverance. There's something about getting up again, trying again, doing it again. It's the godly, everybody trips, but it's the godly who get up and try again and try again and try again. And so uh, that's what we're talking about is again and again and again. And so to do this, we're reading through the story of Nehemiah. It's what we read, uh, kind of the second part of that, getting into chapter two today. Nehemiah is, uh, is a book in the Old Testament that's really just a memoir. It's a, 
It's a biographical. It's, it's written by Nehemiah. It's about his life, uh, journal entries, if, if you will. And it's a really cool story. It's a pretty short story. I would encourage you to read it, but it's a really cool story about a guy who got to do something very significant for God. But when the story starts, he's not that significant. Nehemiah is just a servant. He's a cupbearer. He, he tastes the wine for the king of Babylon to make sure that it's not poison. That was his job. He was so disposable that they were like, hey, listen, you drink the wine first because if it's poison, we are okay with you dying. That's, that's how significant his life was. And so this is a guy who's not that important. He's in the Bible and he has a, Bible, a book in the Bible named after him. So we think, man, he must have been a big deal. He was not a big deal. There was nothing about Nehemiah that was a big deal, but God had other plans for his life. And so what we're doing is we're looking at the story of Nehemiah to to learn some principles. The Old Testament is great for giving us principles for our life that we can just take and apply. We don't, we're not a servant for a king and we're not rebuilding walls that are in ruin, but we are, you know, working somewhere, doing something with our life and trying to rebuild something. So we just want to learn some principles from Nehemiah's story for our life. And the first principle that we learned last week was just taking ownership. It's just taking ownership, no more excuses. We said that, that a fact is a fact, but an excuse is a fact with a narrative. It's a story attached to it. And so we wanna take ownership and come to God and repent for whatever part we played and for, for the ruins that we're dealing with, because we did play a part. And as long as we are not responsible and as long as it's someone else's fault or as long as it's other circumstances fault or as long as it's outside of us, out of our control, we're never going to be able to rebuild it until we take responsibility and say, even in the things that were done without me or the things that were done to me, God, I can repent for something. I can repent for something. I can take ownership of something. And that's what Nehemiah did when he prayed to God. And so as we pick up this second, uh, second chapter in Nehemiah, we're going to talk about this second principle, and that's asking for God's help. Asking for God's help. That if we want to rebuild something, if we want to start again, we don't want to try to do this thing on our own. I hope you know that by now. That no matter how talented you are, or charismatic you are, or, uh, you know, whatever it is, efficient you are, you don't want to do this on your own. We want God to help us. But we're not just asking for any kind of help. We're asking for very specific help, a specific word that we read in our verses today. And that word is favor. Everybody say favor. 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 In verse 11 of chapter one, Nehemiah asked God to make the king favorable to him. This is the word or the request that Nehemiah made to God. God, will you put it in the heart of the king? Nehemiah was asking God to to leave the heavenly spiritual realm and to enter into his life, into the real world and the real details of Nehemiah's life. And he was asking God, God, come in and do what only you can do. Influence a king's heart, change a person's mind. Some of you guys are married to somebody and the only person who's gonna be able to change their mind, come on, is God. Nothing else is gonna change their mind. A boss at your job, the only thing that's gonna change your boss's heart is the Holy Spirit. It ain't going to be anything else. God's 
Man, what, what are you up to, God? It, when something happens, when you see somebody or when you run into somebody or you, or you, you pass by somebody or, or somebody calls your phone that hasn't called you in years or, you know, accidental run-ins or your boss, wants, whatever it is, God, what are you up to? This isn't a coincidence, God. I believe this is providence. And I was just thinking about this for my life and just thinking about, I mean, it's always easier to see in hindsight. It's kind of hard to see in real time, but it's always easier to see in hindsight. And I was just thinking about a couple of examples in my life. Like, for example, I don't believe that it was a coincidence that on a Sunday afternoon in 2002, I got a last minute phone call for a friend of mine whose guitar player got sick and they needed a guitar player really quickly. And I was 45 minutes away, but I said I could get there. And I jumped in my car and I went to play with my friend at this church and I was tuning my guitar when all of a sudden, five minutes before service, the prettiest, tallest redhead walked down the aisle. Some of you are like, redhead, that's not your wife. It was then, it was then. She had died at red. And that was a good choice because it got my attention. And I remember her walking down the aisle and it wasn't really love at first sight because we had met each other at camp and different things, but I was like, you know, 16 and distracted. I wasn't paying attention, but I was on this night. And the rest is history. And I don't believe that was a coincidence. When I look at all that God has done through our life and our children and ministry and all those things, could, could God have done something else? Absolutely, God could have done something else. Am I saying that for every person in the room, there's only one outcome? That's not what I'm saying. This isn't the matrix. But what I am saying is that God was up to something. And that wasn't just a coincidence. I I thought about, you know, how for me, I don't think it was a coincidence that I got a call from a friend of mine 16 years ago to, to ask me, would I be interested in come being the youth pastor at this church in Louisville, Kentucky? And, and I was miserable in Louisiana. It was hot, mosquitoes, and my car didn't have any air condition. And I said, I'll take it. They said, you haven't even interviewed. I said, I'll take it. They said, you don't even know what it pays. I said, I'll take it. <laughs> I'll take it. And we came up here and, and became a part of this church. It was about a year and a half later that Andrew and I were driving to Atlanta, which is what we called home because it's where our family lived and where we met. And about a year and a half after living here, we looked at each other and we felt like instead of going home, we felt like we were leaving home. And we have said, barring God doing something crazy, they will bury us here. Matter of fact, this morning we pulled in on the softball field and Nora said, dad, they need to bury you in the graveyard back there when you die. (laughs) I said, well, we'll talk about that in a long time, I hope. (laughs) Already planning my funeral, but... I don't think that was a coincidence that they could have called any person that they knew who would be interested in being a youth pastor, but they called me. And here we are. That's not a coincidence. Come on. It's providence. I I was thinking about different families and we don't have time to go through all this, but I was thinking about how, you know, it it wasn't a coincidence that, that Kim and Greg Greenwood showed up on the very first Sunday that I was preaching as the interim pastor, looking for a church for their family, sitting back in the back left corner. They show up. It's the first Sunday that the pastor is, the previous pastor is gone and they needed somebody to preach. And God knew that, you know, eventually we would be the pastors and Kim and Greg Greenwood and their family looking for a church. They show up the first Sunday. Come on, come on. That's not coincidence. I was thinking about Brad and Katie signing up to play co-ed softball back here on this cow pasture in the back of the church when we had a co-ed softball league, not even following Jesus, but just liking to play softball. And then relationships started being built and formed. And we could do that for a lot of you guys who are playing softball and just, just different things. We could keep going through all these scenarios and look what God was up to. Look what God was doing. And so often we pray and we want God to show us what our future looks like, but he couldn't show us what our future looked like. We'd never believe him. And if we did believe him, we would have so much anxiety about it because whatever it is that he's doing in the future, we're not even close to being ready for right now. He's doing things in us to to get us ready. Some of you, if you would have asked God, God, what does my life look like in five years, five years ago? And you saw yourself sitting in this church, you'd be like, come on, God, that ain't God. I ain't never going to church. And here you are, here you are. We're not talking about coincidence. We're talking about providence. And, and so for a lot of you, like God has been up to something in your life and it's not a coincidence. And even as I get, as I get older, I can even see how the times that I've run from God 
I'm not saying that running from God was a part of his plan for my life, but as I get older, I can even see how all of the terrible, awful decisions I've made and the times that I ran from God, he used in some way as a part of his plan to do something beautiful and awesome in my life so that even the worst times in my life could be used for something significant. And so we're, we find out at the end of chapter one that the person that God has given a burden to rebuild the walls of his land just so happens to be able to talk to the king every couple of days. Is that a, come on, is that a coincidence that God puts it in the heart of a guy with no, build, no, no construction experience, doesn't own any tools or anything like that, but God just happens to put it on the heart of a person who can have a front row seat to make a request of the king because God knows what he's doing. And so when you begin to have a burden or this itch in your heart or this idea that maybe there is something that needs to be done about a problem or a situation, when you begin to potentially think about what it is that needs to be rebuilt or needs to be improved or needs to be changed, I want you to understand that not everybody gets that feeling. Not everybody has that idea that maybe, probably God is giving you a burden, that God's give, something's bothering you that's not bothering other people. And the reason it's bothering you is because God has positioned you exactly where you need to be to be able to do something about the problem that's bothering you. It doesn't bother everybody else the way that it bothers you. Everybody else is not as concerned about it as as you are concerned. But God has made you concerned or giving you a burden for it because he wants to use you. And the bigger it is and the more intimidating it is, the more God wants to show up and to show out and to show off through your life, through your life. And so... We need something more than just ability, something more than just a burden. We need God's help. Some of you I know today, you're facing what seems like insurmountable odds. Maybe at your job, you've been given a project or a task and you think, if I'm lucky, I could knock this out in a few years, but I don't even think that's gonna happen. Or a family situation or a financial situation or all of those things we've talked about. It feels insurmountable and we need God's help, not just God's help, we need God's help favor. So for the last few minutes, I just want to talk about God's favor. It's a term we find in the Bible in a lot of places, and it simply just means the undeserved kindness of God. But I I like to define it like this. Favor is God doing for me what I cannot do for myself. Favor is God doing for me what I cannot do for myself, which is worth pointing out. Favor is not God doing for me what I could do for myself because I don't want to, or I'm not willing to. Favor is God doing for me what I cannot do for myself. And the favor of God can look a lot of different ways. It can look like getting a job beyond qualifications that you have. It can look like finding, you know, some extra money you weren't expecting. It can look like opening doors that were closed. These are just a few of maybe the more popular examples that we hear of God doing something that you cannot do for yourself. But it's important to know that favor is not just like a genie in a bottle or it's like a, not just a magic ticket. That if you are a Christian today, if your faith is in Jesus, that you have already experienced the greatest kind of favor that God could ever give you or do for you because he did something for you that you could not do for yourself in saving you and forgiving your sins and making you right with God and giving you a relationship with God. So if God never did another thing for you, if you never got a good opportunity, if you never got an open door, if everything from now until the moment you died got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, you still have experienced the greatest favor of God you could ever experience because God did for you what you could not do for yourself on the cross. He gave you a relationship with Jesus. But how good is God that he does more than that? He does more than that. The Bible says that, that if an if a earthly father loves to give, give good gifts to, uh, to his children, how much more a heavenly father? Man, I love to give gifts to my kids. Wow, we just come up with reasons to go to Dairy Queen. We just come up with reasons. I mean, it don't, don't even matter, you know? It, did you tie your shoes right today? We're going to get ice cream. <laughs> Is it, you put your pants on the right way. We're going to Dairy Queen. I mean, it's just, we'll just come up with reasons. 
And, and this is me, a sinful earthly father, just looking to bring joy into my children's life. How much more God? How much more God? The favor of God is the unexplainable, undeniable help of God. And so Nehemiah knows something has to be done. He also knows that without God's favor, there's probably not much he can do. But with God's favor, there's nothing that can't be done. And so Nehemiah says, God, I need favor. Put it in the king's heart to be favorable to me. And so historians say he prays and fasts for about four months. Let's don't skip over that. He prays and fasts for four months. He finally sets up an appointment with the king or has a, has a time to go to the king and he has prayed and fasted and he's asking God for an outcome. He's asking for a change heart in, in the king. He wants God to do something for him that he cannot do for himself. But I wanna just point out really quickly that while Nehemiah was asking God to do something he could not do for himself, there were lots of things that Nehemiah had done. Nehemiah had done some things. He wasn't just, feel, he, he wasn't just feeling bad about it. He wasn't just looking for a, a Hail Mary or a bailout. The king says a couple of things. The king says, I've never seen you sad. Why don't you think about that for a second? Nehemiah had a great attitude. So, so think about this. You're praying for your boss to give you a, a, some kind of response you want. And you're down and you're sad because you've gotten bad news and you walk into your boss and your boss says, you have been the most positive, hardworking, encouraging person I've ever had around our office. Something must be bothering you. What do you think about that? As opposed to maybe the opposite, if that's where we're at. But then when the king and the queen ask, how long will you be gone? Nehemiah doesn't say, well, I don't really know. Hadn't really budgeted. Hadn't really thought about it. Nehemiah knows how long it's going to take. He knows how much it's going to cost. He knows how much timber and how much wood he needs. I want you to get the picture that Nehemiah has asked God to do something that he cannot do for himself, but he has also done everything that he knew to do for himself. He's, he's, he's dotted his I's. He's crossed his T's. He's, he's been diligent. He's worked hard. He's had a great attitude. And so, yes, we need to go to God and say, God, grant me success today. God, change my husband's heart. Change my wife's heart. Change my teenager's heart. Change my boss's heart. Change the judge's heart. We, we need, listen, we need to pray those prayers, but it's, it's worth asking yourself, how early are you willing to get up? How hard are you willing to work? How much are you willing to save? How willing are you able to forgive? How honest are you willing to be? Do you need God to rebuild your marriage? How much counseling are you willing to attend? Do you, do you really need God to rebuild your health? How, 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 how long are you willing to work out at for? Do you need God to rebuild your faith? Like, what are you willing to say no to and give up? You need God to rebuild your finances? What are you willing to sacrifice? Nehemiah is doing something bold and he's asking God for help, but he's also doing everything within his power that he knows to do. And maybe, maybe that's where we are. Maybe before we ask God to grant us success, maybe we need to ask God to help us to do the things that we can do. And we wanna do what we can do and ask God to do what only he can do. And then we wanna do something bold. In all of this, what, what I don't want us to miss is how bold Nehemiah is being. This is a Bible story. Sounds like a fairy tale. So we're like, yeah, this is where the peasant goes and stands before the king. I know this story. But I want you to think about this, that a nobody is talking to the king and asking him for money, soldiers, resources. Like, I mean, this is the equivalent of you setting up a meeting with your senator or your president. This, this king is the most powerful king in the world. This is the largest empire in the world. So let's just take it to the White House. You somehow get a meeting with the president and you walk in and you're like, hey, listen, I'm trying to like redo the landscaping in my neighborhood. And I was just curious, if, you know, right? Like this is bold. And so we want to do everything we can do. We want to get all of our ducks in a row and dot all the I's and cross all the T's and do everything that we can do. But then we want to do something bold. And so I want to give you three, three things, 
three things that I want to encourage you to do if the favor of God is a possibility, and it is. If God's wanting to bless you, and he does. If God's wanting to, to step into your situations, and he does. Then I want to just, just give you three, three thoughts that I wrote down for my life that I want to give you for yours. The first is this. If the favor of God is a possibility, then we have to stop underestimating who we are and where we are. Stop underestimating what you're capable of with God's help. Yes, it's hard parenting a teenager, but you're underestimating who you are and what you've got on your side. Yes, you're way down on the org chart, but you're underestimating who you are and where you are and what you can do with God's help. We have to stop underestimating. The Bible is filled with stories of nobodies that God shows up to. Now, we don't think of them as nobodies because they made it in the Bible, but when God showed up, they were nobodies. Moses was, was given up, not because his mom and dad wanted to give him up, but they were trying to save his life. And so they, they kind of, they put him in the river. You know, you know the story and it's not a coincidence. It's the providence of God that Moses is raised up, but then he kills a man, buries the body. He's a fugitive. He's on the run, 80 years old. He's really done nothing with his life. He's been a letdown and a disappointment and God shows up. And of course, Moses underestimates who he is and where he is and what he can do. And he gives God all these excuses. And God says, you're still my guy. You're still my guy. Esther was in exile, but she was pretty. That's all, that's all we know about Esther. Beautiful. God said, I'll use that. I'll use that. Nehemiah was a, a bartender, I guess. <laughs> but guess who one of his customers was? The most powerful king in the world. God has providentially placed you exactly where he wants you with exactly what you need to make a difference. But in all of these stories that I just told you and more that we could look at, God wasn't just blessing someone for them. He was blessing them and, and giving them favor in their endeavor for a whole lot of other people. God was giving favor to Moses for the nation. God was giving favor to Esther for the nation. God was giving Nehemiah favor for the nation. It could be, possibly, I can't speak for you, but it could be that you've been asking God for favor, but the only person that would benefit is you. Maybe that's not why it's happening. I can't tell you exactly why, but maybe that's possible. And so you got to stop underestimating who you are and where you are. That's the first thing. But the second thing is that if the favor of God is a possibility, we've got to dream bigger. We've got to dream bigger. We have this problem. I, matter of fact, I was talking to a group of people Friday night about it and everybody going around the room was kind of sharing the same story for the most part. We have this problem in Christianity and in the church that we think God only sanctifies us or teaches us lessons through poverty and failure and misery. And, and I get why some of that, because yeah, we, we do get pulled away. We do forget God when things go good. And I understand that but we have this messed up idea that like what God wants for us is to play it safe and not experience success or grow a business or flourish in any way or that what God, you know, and so we begin to kind of self-sabotage honestly, because that wouldn't be God's will. God's will wouldn't be for me to really succeed, to really flourish, to really go beyond. And so we limit our dreams. We limit our prayers Mark Batterson says, in every dream journey, you have to quit living as if the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. You need to have a dream in your life that is destined to fail without divine intervention. Is there anything that you're praying about, any dream in your heart that without God will not work, but with God it could? Are you praying for that and dreaming for that? Have you limited the numbers in your head? Have you limited the... The, 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 the amount of, of uh, influence or have you limited because you think, well, God doesn't want me, you know, I don't want to get too big. You know, I don't, I don't, want, I don't want to go too far. I don't, we got to dream bigger. I mean, we're talking about the God of heaven. We're talking about God himself getting involved in our situations, getting involved in our meetings, getting involved in our proposals, getting involved in our bank loans, getting involved in, in, in our education. We're talking about God showing up and getting involved in the details of our life. And we're gonna, we're gonna aim small. 
Usually we're just afraid of embarrassment. We don't want to say something and then be held to it, so we just aim really small. But what if we decided to get a little bit audacious and decided to dream big, pray big, not just for ourselves, but so that God could use us to do something significant in the lives of a lot of people? And you say, well, what if it happens and then I get, you know, I lose my way? What if I, what if I make a lot of money and then I, I, I lose my way? What if I get really successful and I lose my way? What? Well, God will teach us lessons through success too. But we got to dream bigger. Let's don't limit ourselves and call it noble. Let's don't aim small and, and, and call it godly. Let's dream bigger. But let me give you one more. If, if the favor of God is a possibility, then quite practically, we have to pray for God's favor. Literally. I want to encourage you, as you are talking to God or, or praying to God or sitting in your car before you go into your office or praying in the mornings when you wake up or wherever it is that you spend some time talking to God, I want to encourage you to add it to your vocabulary, to pray for God's favor. What if, and I know this sounds crazy for those of us who are raised kind of in this like low poverty mindset, but what if we actually prayed Nehemiah's words and said, God, grant me success today. I'm looking at my calendar, God. I got three meetings today. That second one's going to be a doozy. That one's going to be tough. But God, will you, will you all go ahead and be preparing hearts favor. Give me wisdom and favor. Make things happen that cannot happen on my own. Influence the situation. Show up. God, I'm submitting this application, and I know that without you, there's no way I'm getting this job. God, will you make me successful? Will you grant me success? Will you put it in the HR department's heart to be favorable towards me? We're just taking literal scriptures and putting them into our life. We don't have to apologize for it. Famous scripture in Hebrews chapter four, where he said, so then since we have a great high priest who's entered heaven, Jesus, the son of God, verse 15, this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. He faced all the same testings we do. 16, so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. We'll receive mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it the most. This verse in Hebrews says we can come boldly to God because of Jesus. And he's talking about relationship and salvation and grace and all that is true. We, more than anything else, we need God's grace and forgiveness and, and favor in our lives for our sin, and our, of course. But that doesn't mean we can't come boldly for other things too because of Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, we would never even dare to approach God. God, but the Bible tells us that Jesus is at the right hand of God and he is interceding on our behalf. We speak in his name. name. Do you know that's why you end your prayers with in Jesus' name, amen. You know, that's not just a tradition, you just say it. It's because you're saying to God, this is not Jason's request. This is Jason's request in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And I've told this story before, but um, when Sadie... One of, my, one of my goals for my kids was that they would play golf. I love golf, and I have one kid who's obsessed with it, so we'll take that. One out of, one out of four is not bad. Um, but when Sadie was, was real little, um, you know, I just kind of like brainwashed her, and we started playing golf. And, um, and she got in the car one day when she was like six or five, I can't remember, and she said, Dad, um, can I get new golf clubs for my birthday? What do you think I said? Yeah. No, no, we're not going to do that. I was like... Are you kidding? I told Andrea, I'm getting her the nicest golf clubs. I mean, I don't know what the budget was for the birthday, but we're going over budget because we're going to get, here, here's my point. She was asking for something that I wanted for her. She, she was saying, um, dad, can I have, and she wanted what I wanted for her in Jason's name is what she was saying. Can I get... <laughs> Can I get some, yeah, right. Okay, well, what, what if God wants some things for you and what you want for your life and what God wants for your life lines up and you start praying in Jesus' name for some things? You think God doesn't want your children to, to serve the Lord? You think God doesn't want to bless you? You think God doesn't want you to experience good things in life? But James says every good and perfect gift comes down from God. The perfect gift he's talking about is salvation, but he's talking about other things too. And so what if you just started praying in Jesus' name and what you want for your life and what God wants for your life started lining up? Maybe the nicest golf clubs you ever got in your life, right? 
And so I want to encourage you, let's pray for it. Let's ask for it. You don't have to apologize for that. If you take it too far and we start praying for Lamborghinis, we'll address it, okay? We'll address that. We'll do that. But you know, we're so far from that. We're not even close to distorting it. We're back here going like, God, no, I don't know. Am I allowed to say this? Like, we're, let's, let's come this way a little bit and be okay with dreaming bigger. Stop underestimating where we are and ask God to help us. So I don't know what you need in your life. I don't know where you're at, what you're facing, but I wanna encourage you, do everything you can do, but ask God to do what only he can do. Ask God for the favor of God on your life to make you successful today. I'm gonna pray for us. Kaylee and the team are gonna come and uh, sing a a couple songs for us. They're gonna have the opportunity to take communion. And here's, as you're taking communion, here's what I want you to know. That when you take that bread and you take that um, juice, you are in that moment, you are remembering and worshiping and celebrating that Jesus Christ was favorable towards you. That in that moment, Jesus came and he came at 33 years, but in that moment, he did for you what you could not do for yourself. Better than more money, better than your kid's situation, better than a job upgrade, better, better than everything you think you want for your life. Jesus showed up in that moment, died on the cross, his body was broken, his blood was shed, and it was the greatest act of favor he could ever do to you. He could ever do for you, I should say. And so in just a moment, when you take communion, I want you to, maybe you just say, God, thank you for your favor. Thank you. My life may not be where I want it to be, but you did for me what I couldn't do for myself. You gave me a relationship with Jesus. You gave me access to God, a relationship with God. That's what we're doing when we're celebrating communion and worshiping communion in just a moment. So I'm gonna pray for us and then the team will, will sing for us. Let's pray. God, thank you for Jesus, for doing for us what we could not do for ourselves having the salvation of our sin, the power to overcome death and hell. He did that through Jesus Christ. So God, I pray that you would help us to live like people who believe that that's true. Help us to live like people who believe that you're on our side. Help us to live like people who believe you want to bless us. Help us to live like people who believe that good things are in store. If you would give us your son, God, what else would you do for us? Help us to dream bigger. Help us to stop underestimating and help us to pray for your favor in the details of our life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.